we don't really have any new prayer requests. That, um, you can make. You can be seated. Yes. So we're ready. Or to do it again. Yes. Up and down and up and down and up and down. I know. Um. Anyway, we uh, are glad to have each and every one of you here. I've already said that. Uh, but um, those of you who have prayer requests, remember there are these prayer request forms in the back, um, on the table back there. If you have a prayer request, fill one of these out, and we'll make sure that we mention it the next week. Uh, so um, please do that. And uh, Terry is the, is the person who handles all of this. Terry Dunneman. Um, wave at us, Terry. Thank you. Uh, we do want to remember those that uh, we've been praying for, continue to pray for those. Uh, we have um, uh, Tammy and Kevin Dunn. Uh, Kevin sits at the front desk in the afternoons on, on the weekends. And so we want to remember him, of course, and his wife, Tammy. Uh, and we want to remember all those travelers who are still coming back. And we thank each and every one of you that have come back. Thank you for coming back. It's always good to have more faces. We have communion this morning. Um, and uh, we'll get to that in a little bit um, after the message, of course. And um, we have the waste baskets on the side to throw your um, waste away and in the back there as well. So we are going to sing to the piano again this morning. Aren't you glad to have the piano music? Yes. Pray a little again. Okay, we're going to start by singing, He is Lord, and then we'll pray. David, 
my sister Susie, I pray, Father, that you would touch each one of them. Lord, and all the travelers that are still traveling back to us, we thank you, Father, for all that you do. We love you. We want you, Father, to have your way in this service this day. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing for this rousing song. We're going to make it rousing, aren't we? There's power in the blood.
we are going to sing, uh, I'm free. I'm free from the fear of tomorrow. I'm free from the guilt of the past. It's an older song, back in the 70s. Not that old, I guess. <laughs> but it's been around a while. Uh, let's start with the chorus, if you don't mind. Can we do that?
That's kind of kind of the series we're in. I'm not calling it a series because I change it every week. <laughs> anyway, so but I, I was thinking of uh, preparing this sermon of the things that a child says and come to first words. Maybe you remember if you have children about your ch children and and how they uh, had the very first words that they spoke. Uh, you know, mama, dad, uh, that kind of stuff. But little, maybe a couple of years old. In fact, Art Linkletter. <laughs> you remember him? <laughs> and he had a show called uh, Kids Say the Darnest Things. Remember that show? And I remember that show. I looked it up when that was on television. Uh, or radio, or I guess it was both, uh, something like that. And it was back in the 50s. Now, I was only a couple years old. <laughs> but uh, I remember the first word, well, uh, the first words of, of our daughter, oldest daughter, she said a lot of different words. But I remember one time, it's about, oh, about two or three years old. And we were, uh, we were talking, we were praying at our meal. We sat down at the dinner table, Connie and I, and uh, Sarah was about two or three years old, like I said, she was in a high chair yet, and she was uh, uh, praying with us. So we all bowed our heads, and uh, I said prayer. And the prayer was over, and Sarah looked up and she said, please pass the damn mishpat mass tables. <laughs> <laughs> now, as a parent, you have to uh, behave yourself, and you dare not laugh. You know, because at two or three, she thought that was really funny, but she didn't know that she said the right word. Anyway, uh, I, I debated whether I should say that because it's church or not. But I noticed Pastor Harry's not here. <laughs> so I think I'm okay so far. So sometimes I wonder, in telling that story, sometimes I wonder about Jesus' childhood. And what were the first words that Jesus said as a little boy? And as he grew up in those early years, what did he say? And were some of the things pretty comical? Uh, did he know what he was saying? Uh, oh, well, uh, we say he's the son of God and he, and he probably knew better. Uh, but he was a child and he's a human being with a child and he grew up. And you wonder about his first word. Well, we don't know much about that. We don't know anything about his first words. But we do know his first words that he spoke in his first sermon. He was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, and so he said a few words there. 
But his actual first sermon came in Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19, where he set the stage for his ministry. He outlined the theme for his ministry in these words. Watch these words. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind, to, to set free, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Those were the first words of Jesus as he spoke in his first sermon to the people. But you know what? It's interesting. Those words are not his words. Those words were said by somebody else before that. But Isaiah the prophet, 700 years before, said the following, here it is up on the screen, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has appoint, appoint, anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim freedom to, for the captives and release from the darkness of pris for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Pretty close to the same thing, but he was setting his own stage for the ministry he would perform. In other words, Jesus was saying in this thing, in this section, I'm going to proclaim freedom for all people. I'm going to come and set the people free. I'm going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, in other words, the Lord's favor upon his people. I want to talk today about that very thing, about how we can be free in Jesus, and what freedom means, glorious freedom, real freedom that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. Freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. Jesus proclaims freedom. Freedom from what? Let's look at that. Jesus said, I set you free from the burden of guilt. We sang about that a few moments ago. I set you free from the burden of guilt. We all experience guilt in one way or another. We never, even some of we never forget. Some people never get over it, feeling guilty. We live with guilt all the time. Sometimes people live indefinitely with guilt. We all make mistakes. We all share. We all have guilt. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8 says, In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. They lavished on us. Guilt, you have it, robs you of happiness. People often tell me in life, I should be happy, but I feel so guilty. I, I should be happy, but I feel so guilty. Ever say that? Yeah. I cause depression, I cause sicknesses, it can lead to suicide. I've talked with people who have felt guilty over the years. Real guilt and false guilt. Real guilt, meaning you should feel guilty. False guilt is you shouldn't feel guilty. I remember a story, a true story, about Frank. Uh, that's a different name than actually he was, but he was Frank to me. And he was our church custodian. And he was having marriage problems, and anger problems, and alcohol problems, and he came to me for counseling one day. We were talking about his life, and his past, and what he's going through, and all the struggles he's going through. And then he told me a story. He said, Pastor, he said, I was 10 years old. My single mother, I had no dad at that time, and she committed suicide. She walked out in the back of the house and she drowned herself in the lake. 
It was devastating for everybody in the family, but especially for me. And I said, why? What happened? And he said, she, he said, my mother committed suicide and a relative of mine turned to me and said, your mother is gone. You must be the man of the house. Imagine if you were 10 years old and you heard that kind of story. And he had some younger brothers and sisters. And he was now in charge of the house. The man went on to say, I lived my whole life with the expectation that I should be better. I lived my whole life with the expectation that I should do more. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't live up to that. I felt guilty. Well, it was false guilt. False guilt. No 10-year-old would be expected to live up to that kind of a demand. Whether it's false guilt or real guilt, it's guilt and it needs to be forgiven and or loved by Jesus Christ to be healed, the person does. The Bible says that when we come to Christ Jesus, he forgives us instantly. He forgives us constantly. He forgives us completely. He forgives us without question. And the Bible says there's three ways in which that happens. Number one, I have buried your sins in the depths of the sea. That's called the out of sight promise. I buried them in the depths of the sea. I've separated your sin as far as the east from the west, it says. That's the out of reach promise. As far as the east is from the west. How far you can't reach that. I have put them where I remember them no more. That's called the out of memory. We call it divine amnesia promise. Divine amnesia promise. Listen closely. Once you learn that God can forgive and forget, God loves you all the more. Once you remember that God forgives and forgets, you can at least try to forget. It doesn't happen that way all the time. You remember that only God can forget. I remember one time preaching this kind of a sermon and a new gal had walked into church that morning and I preached a sermon. It was my custom at that time that I would go to visit every new member that would visit church in the morning. You know, those were days when you'd go knock on the door and they'd be home. And I went and knocked on the door. And the gal met me at the door and I said, I'm Pastor, oh, I remember you. And we walked in and we sat down on the couch. We started talking. And he said, uh, about church on Sunday. I says, what about it? She said, well, I had trouble with your sermon. I said, my sermon was good. I said, what was the problem? I was pretty serious, I'd say that. And she said, I had trouble with it because you said uh, that remember no sin no more and we ought to forgive and, and not remember anymore. I said, well, that's partly it. God forgets, but we don't forget. She said, I'll never forget. But my husband did me for 20 years of my life. I don't forget. He beat me. He slapped me. 
I don't forget what he did. And the longer she talked, the matter she got. But the matter she got was only the memory of what happened to her. And I'm sorry for her. I talked to her about how God still forgives and God still loves. And you have to work it out in your heart, your handling of the situation. But remember, God forgot. And God still loves you. And most importantly, God will heal you. It's going to take a while for healing to take place. <clears throat> but God will heal you. You see, that's the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. I want you to set, be set free from the burden of guilt. You are free in Christ. Your sins are forgiven. And Jesus goes on to say, I will, I will set you free from the pain of resentment. You know, people hurt people. We hurt other people. People hurt us. We're resentful. We're bitter. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage. Let me start that again. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slanders, as well as all types of evil behavior. I love that when, when, uh, when, this, when Paul says this, he starts listing all these different sin, sins and then he says, uh, and by the way, there's all kinds of stuff you should get rid of. Okay? Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. What we like to do when we get hurt is get even. Ever experienced that? We re revenge. We want revenge. We want we we'll get resentful. Remember when somebody hurts you, you are hurt, but it goes back again like a boomerang to you if you are resentful. If you, it's like a poison that eats at you. Are you holding on to hurt? Something in the past? Five, ten, twenty years ago. Let it go. Let it go. Bible says get rid of all bitterness and resentment. I love that scripture that says, just get rid of it. Oh, uh, remember, remember? Christ remembers it no more. God remembers it no more. So get rid of it. What does it mean get rid of it? It means don't let it eat you. Don't let it be with you. Don't let it bother you. Don't let it whatever. You can get rid of it if you don't let it bother you. Jesus Christ came to set us free. Third thing is that I, Jesus says, I want to be free from, Jesus says to you, be free from bad habits and desires. People often say, I can't stop. I just can't stop my desire. I just can't stop my evil habit. John 8, 34 and 36 says, Jesus replied, very, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. You want to be a slave to the sin? Or do you want to be free indeed? Jesus talks about wrong habits and wrong thoughts and enslaves you. But enslaves you in such a way that you can be free if you know Jesus. Illustrate this. Let's say there are certain laws in life that are physical and moral. Physical moral laws. So, for example, let's say you stand on top of the Empire State Building or some tall building. Let's say Empire State Building. And you say to yourself, I'm going to jump off 
Empire State Building. Now, you're exactly right. You're free to do that. You're free to jump off. Nobody's going to stop you from jumping off the Empire State Building if you want to jump off the Empire State Building. You're free to jump. So you jump off. About 20 floors down, <laughs> someone sticks their head to the window. And they say, how's it going? <laughs> and you reply, so far so good. <laughs> you know what? That's true. Uh, but there's a certain thing called the law of gravity that has an effect that keeps you going. And there's serious consequence when you hit the ground. Splat. You hit the ground. That's the law of gravity. In the same way, there are serious effects that happen when a person doesn't get rid of their evil habits or their <coughs> desires. That is, they go splat. We call it, you hit the bottom. And I want you to tell us something, I want you to tell us something about hitting the bottom. For years, I worked in alcoholic, with alcoholics, drug addicts, and so forth. And they always talk about hitting the bottom. And hitting the bottom does not mean you hit the bottom when you fly in a gutter somewhere and you don't have much chance left and you're just lying there without anything in the gutter. Then you really hit bottom. But to hit bottom in its real concrete terms means you hit bottom any time you realize that life isn't getting any better. You hit bottom. So I can be a multi-millionaire living in a mansion somewhere and hit bottom when I realize my life is not going anywhere. When you realize the habit or the desire has taken hold of me. I get money drifting out of my pockets, but I hit the bottom when I realize that. You see, that's the difference. It's your choice. It's what you do with your life that makes a difference. Paul explained this to the Galatians this way. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. I love this section of scripture. It's so honest and so pure. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't do, be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that we are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. You, so you, who are not free to carry out your own good intentions. You see the difference? The scripture says very honestly that we are caught with the spirit and the evil nature. And so we're always fighting that. And we always rely on the Spirit for our goodness, for His grace, and for His love. Fourth thing, Jesus wants to see that we're free from the fear of death. Probably the greatest fear that we have is the fear of death itself. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, Because God's children are human beings, and he the flesh and blood. The Son also became flesh and blood. Now, that's very important to understand. Read it again. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. That means just like us. 
For only as a human being could he, could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. By the power of death. Only in this way could he set me free. For all he lived his lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Very important. Why did Jesus become a human being? He became a human being like us for every reason, including death of the cross, including dying. Not the cross, not the forgiveness of sins right now, don't think of that, but dying. He died our death. He died our death. And if he died our death, what does death mean? But life in Christ. Life in Christ. Devil had the power of death, eternal death, no hope, no victory, no promise. But Christ had the eternal life. Christ had eternal life. And died, he gave us eternal life. See, people like to talk about death. I've never been invited to a backyard barbecue and a topic was that death came up. <laughs> Nobody ever sent me an invitation saying, please come to our house for another great time and we're going to talk about death. The only time that someone really talked about death, that I saw that really talked about death, Con and I were at a restaurant and it was cold in the restaurant. And we were wondering why it was so cold in there every time, especially when a door which. Uh, <laughs> I remember that. Number five, okay. Um, especially when the door closed and it, it, uh, and it opened. And we noticed a bunch of people walking in with dark clothes on dark suits on, and women with dark clothes on. And we asked the waitress, it's cold when that door opens, and those people, who are those people? And she said, it's a mortician dinner. <laughs> I said, are there always that cold <laughs> mortician dinner? And they were that cold, as it happened. So, the mortician dinner, fear of death. People don't like to talk about it. They fear death, because death is the great equalizer. Doesn't make a difference how much money you have, how much education, how much how, the house you live in. When you die, you die. You know, I once worked as a hospice chaplain for many years. I've told you that many times. I remember a story about a man who was involved as a patient of ours. And I was talking to him one day, I made the first call on him, and the guy was very sick. He had respiratory problems, and he was uh, uh, near death. He came to uh, us, and he uh, 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 was living with his grandson. And he was very ill. So, I constantly made a visit on him every couple of weeks or so to try to just build him up a little bit to uh, help him to prayer for dying. And by the way, the hospice chap hospice ministry is to prepare someone to die by helping them to live the last of their life. That's you prepare someone to effectively die is to help them effectively live the last of their life. And so I visited with him and I talked to him about living, at living your life to the fullest until you uh, passed away. 
Well, he was very ill, but gradually he began to gain some strength. And so I asked him on one of the visits, I said, what would, what would you really like to do before you die? He said, I really would like to go fishing. One last time. I said, okay, we'll help you get a fishing license. And so we had him, uh, we helped him, we got a fishing license, and one day I went to make my regular visit on him, and I got to the front door, and the door was locked, and on the sign of the front door said, gone fishing. <laughs> he went fishing. So the next time I visit with him, he says, you know what, I'd like to go to church. And I said, what church? And he gave me a name, and so I called the church, and then sure enough, they had a, a way in which they could pick him up and bring him to church. And so he got to church and asked him about church. He says, wonderful time at church. And in fact, he says, I, I met somebody I hadn't seen for years. So I moved back to the area now. I, I met this, this lady. And he met this lady and her and her husband, he had died and they had been friends with this guy and his wife. And his wife had died. And so he kept going to church and seeing this lady and another visit I made unto him, asked him about what was going on with him and the lady and he said, we're dating. <laughs> and next time, a couple business later, he says, we're getting married. And they got married. The guy had new hope. He felt like living again. He still faced death. He had terminal illness. But he was free from fear because he knew Jesus Christ's life, and he had new hope. You see, Jesus Christ sets us free from the fear of death when he gives us new life and new hope. And so finally, Jesus simply sets us free. He sets us free. What's enslaving you? A secret sin? Sin in the past, regret, failure, mistake, some relationship that's gone sour somewhere along the line. Christ sets us free. Relax. Relax. Admit it. Admit it to God. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask for his cleansing. Ask for his hope. Ask for a clean slate. Jesus Christ came to set us free. He didn't come to bind us. He didn't come to plague us. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to free us. Free us from what we're doing wrong. If I were, if you were here today, and you are here today, and you have a burden, give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Get rid of it. You are forgiven. Accept it. Accept the fact that Christ loves you and is real. Maybe it's resentment. Maybe it's bitterness in your life. Christ can flush the poison out of your life and give you forgiveness and love. He can free you. Whatever it may be, Christ has set you free. Jesus said, come you might have life and have it full and free and complete here and there. There's a phrase I'd like to use sometime in talking to people, especially when I have to say goodbye to someone I haven't seen for a long time and I won't see them for a long time. I say something like this, I'll see you again here there, up in the air. <laughs> Here, there, up in the air. Freedom in Christ is what we have. Freedom in Christ 
is what it's all about. Freedom in Christ is for real. Christ has set us free. John 8, 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. We remain faithful to him and we are free. Free indeed. Today, we gather together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, more than anything else, is a meal of freedom. Here, in this place, at this time, with bread and juice, body and blood, He sets us free. He sets us free that we might be free indeed in Him. And so remember what the Apostle Paul said to us one time, he said, I received from the Lord, but I also passed on to you. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A meal of freedom, a meal of love, come and receive it today. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the freedom that we have today, this day and every day, through your shed blood for us. And because of that shed blood for us, we have the knowledge and the hope and the promise of freedom in sin, sin freedom from sin, freedom to live this life, freedom in the next life yet to come because of your love and grace for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. As the gentlemen are passing the elements, we're going to sing the song, Behold the Lamb. We have two different kinds of elements today. Um, so, be careful which one we, we get. One of them has the juice on the top, and if you open the wrong one, you're going to have juice spilled all over you. And the bottom, the bottom tray uh, has the, or the one with the purple top, has the two pieces on top of each other. The bread is on, under the first lid and the juice is under the second lid. So let's sing the, the Behold the Lamb as they're passing it out. <clears throat>
take and eat, this is a true idea for those who say you Jesus Christ. Take and drink, this is true life for those who say you Jesus Christ. true body and blood given and shed for you. Be with you now and remain to always. Amen. Let's all stand please. We're going to sing My Desire to Be Like Jesus. Then we will be dismissed.